Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this new edition of the Ithaca Fest. Uh, today um, we start with John Burke and the first talk is going to be Bicategorical Enrichment in Algebra. John, take the stage. All right, so thanks very much for the invitation. So this is a uh, joint work with Soichiro Fuji, who's recently joined us in Brno as a postdoc. And uh, yeah, it's kind of work in progress. So hang on. Uh, yeah, let me try and move this slightly. Um, okay, but so, so what the motivation is, is often in category theory, one doesn't just want to work with categories but with like categories over some base category. So, you know, you might look at a category of algebras for a monad or something sitting over the category of sets, uh, which you need to formulate certain theorems like Beck's theorem, uh, or you can have like topological categories, uh, topological functors, things like this. So often one wants to look at some sort of categories over a base, okay? Um, and a cool thing is that you can capture categories over a base as enriched categories, um, where, but you don't use enrichment over a monoidal category, but over a bi-category. So, um, and this isn't so well known. I don't even know it very well myself, I would say, um, the whole story. Um, probably the Italians know it much better than me, um, since it sort of involves them. But, uh, so Richard Garner, so I kind of got interested in this, um, when I read a paper of Richard Garner a few years, like a few years ago called, uh, topological equals total, where he showed that you can view, um, topological functors as exactly, uh, enriched categories in this sense with some nice properties um, being total in the sense of enriched category theory. And that was kind of cool. And he gave some applications of it to like McNeil completions and stuff like this, which I don't know that well, but anyway. But so if it's fruitful in topology, what about algebra? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, so, okay, so here's the sort of motivating problem. Uh, so suppose you have a monad on a category C. So everybody knows from first course in category theory, and we all like this fact that every algebra is a co-equalizer of free ones, right? Uh, we all know this indeed just from... Uh, or intuition about algebra. Uh, you have some free structure and then you form some quotient of it by some equation. So just universal algebra. Um, so you can ask, it's a natural question to ask, is the category of algebras uh, free co-completion of just the free algebras? So the Cleisey category, say under co-equalizers, okay? It's a natural question. Um, the problem is that the category of algebras doesn't in general have all co-equalizers. It just has, in general, co-equalizers of parallel pairs of ROs, uh, which when you take their underlying parallel pair as a split co-equalizer, right? So this is, we sort of know this from things like Beck's theorem. Uh, but the problem with that is that these uh, split co or use split co-equalizers, so it's referring to the forgetful functor, right? When you talk about U split, and that's not a diagram shape because it involves the functor as well. So, uh, so the answer is uh, uh, no, you can't get the category of algebras as um, free code completion under co-equalizer. So of course, in some restrictive settings, you can get it as co-completion of free algebras on finite things, maybe under the co-limits or whatever, uh, which is great, but that's not what uh, I want to do here. We want to look at things in complete generality, okay? 
Um, so natural question to ask is, is there some sense in which the category of algebras is a frequent completion of the Claisley category? That's what I want to think about. And so the answer is yes, um, using bicategorical enrichment, okay? Uh, and so I'm not gonna give much references today, but, um, but so there's a list of names associated with the development of, bi of enrichment and bicategories. Um, you can see a couple of Italians there, I think. Um, and then there was Isar Stubba more, gen uh, more recently was also did a lot of quantiloid enrichment, which is a special case of bicategorical enrichment, which is indeed what we're gonna look at today. I don't know if Isar is there, he mentioned to me, he might call me. But anyway, um, all right. So uh, that's the story I wanna tell you. And so I'll start by uh, going into, um, since it's not entirely standard and to by enrichment in by categories. Okay. So suppose you have a by category B, um, then a B category, a B enriched category has a set of objects. So, okay. Or a class of objects you want, they're not going to worry about that sort of stuff. And it's got a function called the extent function which takes an object of A to an object of B. This is where it's different to usual enrichment in monoidal categories. Otherwise, basically the same. So, except it looks a little bit different. So at a, at a pair of objects of A, you have a sort of home one cell, home AB from the extent of A to the extent of B, okay? And, uh, and then you have the composition in your enriched category is captured by two cells in the by category B uh, as depicted. Uh, does that make sense? So, yeah. And so you have the usual or the nat well, natural associativity as in, not as in natural associativity as in McLean's paper or whatever, but just the obvious axioms, the associativity and unit axioms there, uh, which we don't actually care about because in many cases, B is uh, locally a post-saddle by category, locally post-saddle. So, uh, so those equations are redundant anyway. Um, if you're dealing with, for instance, a so-called quantiloid, then, which there's lots of examples and our main one will be. Um, you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, so what's the point? The point is that this generalizes classical enrichment. Uh, if you have a monoidal category, you can view it as a one object by category. And uh, you look at categories enriched in that, then you get the usual ones we, we know uh, because all of those extent things just trivialize and then you're left with on um, objects, on um, AB, and uh, the usual sort of compositions like you have in an enriched category. Okay. Um, all right. And I'll just briefly mention there's also enriched functors um, and enriched natural transformations, and you get two category of enriched categories. Um, yeah. So the only maybe thing, so the difference to the classical monoidal category cases, you just have to keep track of this extent stuff. So the enriched functors involve a function which commutes with the extent function. So you've got like a commutative triangle there. Um, and so a well-studied case is the quantiloid case, which is where these things, where these are locally uh, complete lattice, they're locally posets, just well-behaved posets. What does that mean? In this context, it means complete lattice, and uh, you want them to be co the composition to be co-continuous in each variable. Then you call it a quantiloid. You get co-continuous in each variable means they have right adjoints, and then you can do 
more home like constructions and stuff but doesn't really matter for our purposes what this actually means we just uh because we're just going to look at one example really um but yeah for example you could take the by category sets and relations okay be an example of a quantaloid here's the three quantaloid introduced by rosenthal so take a category c you can form the free quantaloid on it so same object as c um what's a morphism what's a one cell is the main thing so a one cell between two objects of c instead of just taking morphisms from a to b we take all sets of morphisms you can possibly take from a to b and so you're taking a uh, the power set of morphisms from A to B, in fact, right? So that's a, a complete lattice. And we can order these by inclusion. So that gives you your post set structure. And that gives you your by, by category structure, in fact. So you just compose these subsets just by um, composing the individual arrows, so component wise. So does that make sense? All right. So that's a very nice thing. Um, Rosenthal in his paper didn't seem to study what a category enriched in these, uh, this QC is, but uh, so what does it involve? So it involves a set of objects of A and a function, which I'll suggestively call U from of A to of C, since of C is the set of objects of Q to C. And what else? Uh, plus we've got subsets, hob, hom A, B contain, well, like, uh, yeah, big A, A, B contained in big C, U, A, U, B, okay? And so uh, closed under composition identity. So that's, that gives you the, uh, that's the enriched category structure. And if you think about what that is for a second, you'll see it's uh, exactly uh, where it's an instance of a faithful functor, right? So that's a faithful functor. Um, okay, if you wanted exactly the faithful functors, you should replace this quantaloid. Instead of taking subsets, just take monomorphisms, okay? Just take monomorphisms over om a b, and then you get exactly the faithful functors. Here you get the faithful functors up to isomorphism anyway. Um, yeah, uh, so we'll say this is exactly the faithful functors, and slightly handier because people have developed the, the quantaloid enrichment a bit more, and it enables us to work in the quantaloid case. It doesn't really matter anyway. Um, so you get, basically, you get exactly the faithful functors. I learned this from uh, Richard's paper. Made me happy because I didn't think I understood this bicategorical enrichment stuff very well before it. But when I saw this nice, simple example, it was uh, like, oh, yeah, well, makes sense. And it always stuck in my head that this is a way to capture sort of concrete uh, categories in a sense over a base and which is something I've thought about in many different contexts for various reasons. But um, yeah, just a tiny bit more on that. So the objects of QC cat faithful functors, the arrows are just commutative triangles because they have to commute with extent. And the two cells are natural transformations such that when you apply uh, V to them, you get the identity. Okay, well, we won't even really need that. So, that's, but that's just to give you the idea. Um, okay, so we, let's look at some examples of QC enriched categories. Take any monad, then you can look at the forgetful functor from the Eilenberg Mur category. Uh, it's always faithful. So, that's a QC enriched category. Um, there's just a formula, by the way, for these things, if uh, the Clazy one, maybe people 
It's good to have in your head. Um, also, the forgetful functor from Claisley, which actually applies T, is uh, faithful since the composite of fully faithful and faithful. Um, and so this is indeed, this is a morphism of QC cat, right? So it makes sense to ask if it's a free co-completion, for instance. All right, a tiny, slightly technical bit. So you can mention, you can look at uh, weighted co-limits in the setting of enriched category theory here. Um, so we're not going to worry about the generality or the general theory, but let me just tell you a tiny bit about what happens over QC, okay? So, so for QC, a, a QC weight, well, it's as for any weight, it's always the domain is some enriched category. So here's an enriched category of faithful functor from J to C. Um, and then a weight on it amounts to a per WC, where uh, W is a regular weight on J, so a functor from J up to set. And then you've got a separate object of C, little c, such that W is a uh, subfunctor like this, okay? So if you know about enriched category theory, that's actually an example of a weighted cocoon. Uh, but yeah, let's not worry too much about the generalities. So the main case of interest to us is Take a co-equalizer diagram in C, okay? Let's form a weight from it. So we're going to take the diagram shape just to consist of the power of arrows F and G in C, okay? And then we need to give the weight itself. Well, the weight's just going to be the constant, uh, constant weight the trivial one, it's got a single element in each component. To do this subset business, we need to actually include it in to these two homes, but so it should have an element at B, at B and that'll be the single morphism from B to C representing the co-equalizing RO in the cone. And then it should also have an element at A, which will be the single morphism from A to C, HF equals HG, since we have a co-equalizer cone, okay? And uh, yeah, and that, so that's the weight. So we've got this weight, I call it WFGH, since it depends on all three parts of the co-equalizer diagram. Um, and then, so what does it, what's the, so a diagram in this sense, so a QC functor from uh, the domain of the weight to a category, an enriched category A, is going to, what's it going to do? It's like a commutative triangle like that. Well, it just picks out a parallel pair of arrows, which lives over the original pair in C, okay? So that makes sense. And then, and then, uh, and in fact, so the, what's the universal property of the weighted co-limit of this in the sense of bi-category and rich category theory, which I haven't went into, but we let's not worry about it. It's exactly a lifting of the co-equalizer in the base to a co-equalizer up, up above. So it's a lifting of the co-equalizer, okay? And that's the idea is that these sort of uh, weighted co-limits in this sense capture liftings of co-limits. And so these are, th these are sorts of things we start to see now in the setting of Things like Beck's monodicity theorem, right? Bear in mind that that lifting is an actual lifting on the nose, though. Because it amounts to saying the extent of Z is C. All right, so now what's our class of weights? So we take all of those weights, WFGH, corresponding to split co-equalizer diagrams, okay? And now a uh, faithful functor has FICO limits just when it has 
co liftings of co-equalizers of U-split pairs. In other words, if you've got a parallel pair upstairs and down below it has a split co-equalizer, then you should have a lifting of that in A. There should exist one, okay? And moreover, uh, functor in QC cat preserves these FICO limits just when it preserves U split co equalizers. Okay. All right. So, so here's our first theorem is that the Ellenberg Mer category is a free co completion under five weighted co limits. So, I'll just sketch the proof. So, the key points are that the forgetful functor creates co-equalizers of U to the T split pairs. So in other words, the category of algebras as an enriched category is FICO complete by the previous slide. We already know that every algebra is a co-equalizer of threes. So it's, it's a UT split co-equalizer indeed uh, from Beck's theorem. Moreover, don't worry too much about this, but homing out of each thing in the image of the Claisley inclusion preserves you to the T split co-equalizers by this deduction, because it's a free algebra. So you can write it equally as the composite of the forgetful and the representable, and both of those preserve them. So combining two and three, you have what's called a a one-step density presentation via U to the T split co-equalizers. Um, so that's all useful. So now you can use that, say, if we want to verify we have the free co-completion, consider now a functor F from C to the, from the Claisy category to A, um, where A has liftings of U split co-equalizers. By two and three, we can then for the uh, left can extension along the inclusion of the Claisley category, uh, just by basically defining, uh, you know, at an algebra, you apply F to the uh, free things, the free algebras in two and take the co-equalizer of the resulting diagram in A. So you just co-continuously extend using this co-limit in two. And by the nice, well, you could just check it directly, but by the nice theory of density presentations, you know that any extension like that will uh, preserve all U to the T split co-equalizers. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's just pretty easy. That's the, or it's natural, let's say it's not very difficult. That's the... That's the proof. That's the uh, core of the proof. Um, so that's a nice fact, I think, that you have a free co-completion. You can view the category of algebras as a free co-completion. So here's another, uh, more generally. So suppose you have a forgetful functor with a left adjoint, and suppose that it creates co-equalizers of U-split pairs, okay? like in Beck's theorem. Well, then you can take the induced monad and look at the induced map from the Claisley category. Okay. And that's also a free co-completion of the Claisley category. And the proof's almost exactly the same. You just generalize that. The only thing you really use is that uh, that cocon that I've drawn there is a co-equalizer cocon. And that's because we assumed you create co-equalizers, so it should reflect them, right? And it's sent to a U-split one. So uh, that becomes a co-equalizer. You use this sort of stuff in Beck's theorem as well. Um, but yeah, it's just, a it's just the same proof as on the previous slide, slightly generalized. Um, Here's proof of Beck's theorem. So Beck's monodicity theorem, let U have left adjoint F, suppose it creates co-equalizer U split pairs, then A is equivalent to the category of algebras. So by the previous slide, both A and the category of algebras are free co-completions 
Yeah, I'm almost done, by the way. Um, by the uniqueness of free code completions, uh, we get the equivalence. Um, I, I've just written a couple. Of, so the usual inversion involves the canonical map from A to C to the T, but, but it also follows. And also people usually use creation, not on the nose, but in the up to ISO sense. But you can also get that in two lines if you want. And the final thing I wanted to say was about generalizations. So to capture enriched monads over on enriched category C, you can do the same thing. You just have to use a different uh, by category, the same objects, but now you look at the, so HOM AB will be an object of V and you have to look at the slice over that. Uh, I'll go, I'll just say this quickly. This has been studied by Fuji and Lack. Um, and I should mention that it's not a quantiloid. And the fact you, the main thing you need is that these VC co-limits capture liftings again. And I should mention that Alex Campbell just recently gave a talk about this at the Sydney seminar. So we would need to, I believe that's what he talked about. Um, I just saw the abstract, so we'd need to use his uh, results for that. But um, otherwise, the same proof should basically work. And we're still investigating more stuff in about bicategorical enrichment. And uh, thanks for listening. I think it's just a fun story and a nice, uh, a nice way. The fact that you can see categories of algebras as really free co-completions is it gets, um, I think it's a nice approach to Beck's theorem and, uh, and uh, just the, I, I like the idea of using uh, these, of viewing concrete categories as enriched categories. Uh, and I believe there's more to be said about that, but yeah, that's it from me. So thanks for listening. Thank you, John. And now we move to question time. Uh, so if we have questions, people can unmute themselves and and just ask. So I have a short question. Um, by the way, thanks a lot for the talks. Uh, is there anywhere where I can read more about this? Well, um, not yet, but... Um, so the plan is to write uh, a paper. Um, I have the idea to write a short paper about it. Though then now, so so Chiro has been developing lots more stuff about a bicategorical enrichment in algebra. So so we'll see where it ends up. So I I recommend uh, for faithful functors as enriched categories. Uh, I recommend Garner's paper. Um, topological equals total, which introduced that idea. And then, uh, and then, yeah, that would be something. <laughs> uh, but I am, we are hoping to write something down about this, but now it's not ready at all yet. This is very much work in progress as well. Thanks, uh, looking forward to that. The next question is by Talbeck, Taltek, which I guess is Pavel. Hi, John. It's uh, Nathaniel. Oh, Hi, Nathaniel. Oh, sorry. I apologize, Nathaniel. Uh, this is a very really nice perspective. I was wondering whether you had considered the two-dimensional version and whether you can recover your monodicity theorems for two monads using this perspective. I have not thought about that. That's uh, it's a good question, actually, though, because all that stuff uh, that I had is also about concrete is about liftings and lifting certain kinds of structures. So it's a very it's a good question, and I mean, I it did occur to me that you know also the sorts of infinity versions or higher versions that you have for these for, of Beck's monodicity theorem and things like that also very much fit into this sort of uh, world. And I would imagine that 
this kind of bicategorical enrichment and all those senses could uh, have something be a sort of clarifying way of thinking about them. But I haven't, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just speaking um, uh, off the top of my head here and I haven't thought about it any further than that. But thanks for the idea. Uh, okay, I think Giacomo has a question. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, have you considered free XLX completions as something that might arise like that? Because you are freely adding co-equalizers of equivalence relations in some sense, but you don't have any faithful functors playing around, so I don't know. So I mean, yeah, in the X, I guess in the X lex completion, what, what do you have any functor not faithful? You've got the map to the completion, right? But you don't have a forgetful thing going back. So yeah, um, no, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, it doesn't feel very concrete in that case. So I don't really see it. Um, the faithfulness doesn't really matter because you can also get just functors over a base as enriched categories where you get rid of the uh, the subset business and just look at genuine or general ROs. And it's actually probably simpler to think of things that way, but, but you still need to be working with some sort of concrete structures. So that one doesn't strike me as... Uh, Enrico has a comment, I think. Uh, hi, John. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is a kind of vari variant of the question by Giacomo. Uh, when C is the set, then Ellen Moore is also the exact completion of the Claisley. Do you think that there is a connection or is it just an accident? No, that's a good... Yeah, I mean, when I, when we sort of had this idea, it did, the thing it reminded me of was indeed your uh, result from your thesis, I think, about this fact that uh, uh, Ellenberg Merck categories as exact completions, I, I hadn't really, I haven't really thought about it. Uh, I, I could, I, I could easily believe there's a connection there. But I haven't I haven't thought haven't thought further about it, but it's a good uh, it's a good thing to think about whether uh, these exact completion sort of stories, at least in the setting of uh, algebras for a monad, fit into this can be seen in within this framework in some way as well. But I don't have an answer for you. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay, we don't have time for another question, which means I have to cut my question now. Um, so we thank the speaker one last time. Uh, thank you, John, for the very nice talk. And we move to the next speaker of the day. Thank you, John. Thanks. So I should stop sharing.